Our first speaker tonight is Catherine Reed. In 2006, Catherine's youngest child was diagnosed with autism. Uh, through in-depth research, she determined that certain foods common in the Western diet were associated with her daughter's autistic behaviors. Catherine Reed ho holds a PhD in biochemistry and is the executive director and founder of Unblind My Mind, unblindmymind.org, a nonprofit that educates on the links between the foods we eat and the chronic illnesses we suffer. Catherine has over 20 years of experience in biotechnology and molecular diagnostics research, training that would find her ideally suited to tackle her most challenging scientific endeavor. Please welcome Catherine Reed. I just realized my microphone was hanging down and dangling by my feet. I got it on there? Oh, good. Well, thank you. Um, my name is Catherine Reed, and I'm the executive director of Unblind My Mind, which is a nonprofit, 501c3, um, focused on improving health one bite at a time. And today I'm going to share my favorite topic, but I have many um, glutamate, and talking about the secret ingredient's impact on health. So, why do we need to unblind? Well, I don't think our statistics uh, you know, can lead us any more information there that over 25% of Americans suffer from a diagnosable disorder affecting the brain. And notice I don't use the word mental illness, I'm saying a disorder that affects the brain in a given year. 11% we've got now between the ages of four and 17 years old diagnosed with ADHD or ADD. About 18% suffer from anxiety, nine and a half suffer from depression, greater than 1% afflicted with autism, and disorders that impact the brain are the leading cause of disabilities in the United States and Canada. In addition to disorders that impact the brain, we have two out of three adults that are considered overweight or obese. 9.3% of our US population has diabetes, and one out of two adults have at least one chronic illness. So this is why we need to start unblinding and changing our approach as to how we deal with health. So what does Unblind Mind of Mind do is we unblind, educate, and train. And we do that through raising awareness like tonight, um, looking at some of the links between some foods and the chronic illnesses we suffer, educating, and a lot of this is about training. Because what I'm about to say is, is you know, we, we had some Western Price people so they'll understand this too, a lot of what we are doing in the standard American diet really needs retraining in terms of how we define food. This is where my journey started. It's probably a good thing that the volume wasn't too high. That's okay. There's another video coming up. That is my youngest daughter, Brooke, soon after she was diagnosed with autism. And this is one of the episodes, and I videotaped this episode to try to describe to the neurologist what, what I was referring to as these yes-no loops. She would go into this loop-like behavior where, yes, I want that, no, I don't want that. And these loops would last for hours. This particular loop was over whether or not she wanted a movie or not, and it lasted for four hours. Screaming, just completely more and more um, excitable, and very distraught. She would oftentimes just exhaust herself to sleep. That's what would bring her out of these loops. Sometimes she would just wake up in the middle of the night resuming the exact same loop that she had before she went to bed. In addition to uh, these yes, no loops, just like you said, my scarf moved. Here were some other symptoms that were consistent with the autism diagnosis. Oops. Okay. Yo, sister, Brooke, Elizabeth. Unresponsive to name, unable to engage, we love no you, expression Brookie. or emotion, unable to engage in Mommy conversation. Mama. Let's go to the mountain. She's talking to herself. There's children Where's all over the place. There's no facial expressions or joy that she had on her face. And so at this point, uh, soon after the diagnosis, as a mother, I was absolutely distraught. Despite having lots of experience with raising children, as you can see in the family photo, I didn't know how to parent this child. I didn't know how to help her. 
But as a scientist, I became somewhat obsessed with what would cause some of these you know, health issues and what can I do as a parent and a scientist. But I started looking at the physical symptoms, and when I brought her in to doctors, you know, frequently, the comorbidities or the other physical symptoms that were, I think, associated with her well-being were often ignored. I brought her in three times saying she hasn't gone to the doctor or hasn't gone to the bathroom in six days. And they would say, that's normal. No, I'm sorry, that's not normal. Three times I'm bringing her in saying, she is completely constipated, her stomach is bloated, she's got physical signs of inflammation, red eye shiners, puffiness in the cheeks, and she just looked sickly. She was frequently, you know, with inflammation, allergies, asthma, any little illness would bring about this asthmatic attack on the lungs, kind of like on this computer, um, where she was unable to breathe you know, and, and literally could not lift her head up off the pillow every time she came down with any slight illness. So, <laughs> I think I remember the slide. Um, so as a parent, I thought, you know, as we're going through these evaluations and the long process associated with what you go through in the medical community when your, your child is diagnosed with autism, I decided to start looking at all sorts of different therapies. We explored ABA, play therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. It took us three months to go through an evaluation to have her qualify for a special needs preschool, which she qualified for. AIT, which is auditory integration therapy. These therapies did not do anything for us. What helped us was diet. What I want to take you through is that journey and my unblind my mind journey um, on how, what exactly really helped her. First and foremost, and this will become very important when I talk more about the microbiome, is it's essential that we have nutrient-rich fibers in the diet. And I like it from the leafy green vegetables and the vegetable of sorts. At the point of starting this, my child ate about five foods. Bagels and cream cheese, macaronis and cream cheese, pizza, if I tried to put broccoli on her plate, she threw a fit. I could not get this kid to eat any vegetables. But when I started to take away the very foods that she was very addicted to, I started to see some transformations. I had no idea why so many parents in the autistic community were taking gluten and casein away from their children and seeing some improvements. Nobody was stating, oh, I've you know, reversed autism through removing gluten and casein. But at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm, it's worth a try. So we removed gluten and casein from her diet, gluten being the class of proteins associated with wheat and barley, casein being the class of proteins associated with dairy. Now, I'm a protein chemist by training, and so it didn't make sense to me why these foods would particularly be helpful by removing, but I did it. And we did see some improvements. But she was still on the spectrum. We still were dealing with the, the yes, no loops and all of the behaviors. She was still in the special needs school. So we weren't getting as far as we had liked. So I started, as any protein chemist would do, is look at the amino acid structures of gluten proteins and casein proteins and saying, what in the heck is the common element here as to why removal of these proteins might be significant in her health? And what else should I be looking at? And then I started to look into the connection between gluten and casein and glutamate. If you have a depiction of a protein here, which each circle represents an amino acid, and amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, the average protein has about 5 to 10% of glutamic acid or glutamate as part of its protein structure. Proteins linked together or amino acids linked together by peptide bonds. But gluten and casein have over 25% of their protein structure containing glutamate. And if you think about these proteins, they're not just consumed raw, except if you're doing what the Weston Price was advocating with raw milk. They're often very processed foods, where you've got ultra-pasteurization, enzyme modification, acid hydrolysis, fat removal, fermentation, 
And all of these processes start to degrade the proteins, breaking up those amino acids, creating free amino acids and free glutamate. So I'm going to talk about today glutamate. What is it? Why is it important to regulate in health? Where is it? And how do you balance it? Now, there's several pathways that can start to create glutamate excess and glutamate issues. Today, I'm mainly going to focus on the food component. I love the microbiome component. I could talk all night about that. And how it triggers the inflammatory and the immune response is not very well known, but that's another whole element of how it all increases glutamate signaling. So what is glutamate? First of all, it's an amino acid metabolized by every single organism on this Earth. I'm not sure about other planets, but Earth, that's what's going on. In humans or mammals, it's an excitatory neurotransmitter that is responsible for exciting over 40% of our nervous system. It's used in energy balance, digestion regulation, ammonia balance, memory learning, inflammatory and immunological responses, and so much more. What's often confusing is that glutamate goes by several names in mainstream media so that you have these people kind of throwing around different words, but they have the same activity. Glutamic acid is just the protonated form. Glutamate just means it's charged. And glutamate, when it has a negative charge there, loves to bind to a counter ion. Monosodium glutamate, calcium glutamate, magnesium glutamate. All of those are the exact same in terms of how it reacts in our body. It's free glutamate. Now, glutamate signaling, you'll hear me mention quite a bit, and glutamate binds to glutamate receptors and has a signaling cascade associated with it. A lot of people think about this mainly from our nervous system, where it's exciting the nervous system, but many different types of cells have glutamate receptors and receive a signal by glutamate binding to the glutamate receptors and causing an entire cascade of different regulatory functions. It's like having one key, glutamate, unlocking many doors. And here's just an example of how it's regulating glucose metabolism, insulin secretion, and think about where I'm going with metabolic or energy utilization issues it's incredibly diverse in its functions. Just looking at a KEG pathway, KEG is the uh, uh, open source metabolic pathway, I love it. Um, this is just on glutamate alone, with all of the ways that glutamate enters into these various metabolic cycles, histidine metabolism, nitrogen metabolism, glutathione metabolism, urea, and the list goes on. So we need glutamate, absolutely no question about that. So if glutamate's natural, what's the issue? And the issue is excess. There are many diseases and disorders associated with glutamate dysfunction. And when I started to look into the literature, when I was thinking, OK, here's an association. Is there any association with autism? I felt like it hit the mother load. If you go into the Google you know, Scholar and look up glutamate and all these sorts of various diseases, you'll see that the pharmaceutical industry is all over glutamate regulation as the mechanism behind many, many different diseases. From Alzheimer's to cancer to obesity to schizophrenia, the glutamate blocker drugs are making billions, many in research, development, and in market for regulating glutamate. So I decided to take a different approach. If we're trying to regulate glutamate by blocking glutamate from binding to its various receptors, which has a horrific you know, slew of side effects, what if we take glutamate out of the diet to see if that's a better way to regulate it? I just wanted to put in all of the scientific, not all, um, just some scientific references linking glutamate to ADHD and mood disorders, glutamate and autism, glutamate and diabetes. It says, you know, monosodium intake is associated with the prevalence of metabolic sy syndrome in rural Thai population. I mean, these were entire 
population studies looking at the impact of consumption of MSG. <coughs> Glutamate and obesity, it has a lot to do with our appetite and the, um, and here was a study uh, in China, consumption of monosodium glutamate in relation to incidence of overweight in Chinese adult. I think there was like 10,000 people in that study. If the food trend, and so Olney is my, my hero here. So John Olney in 1969 was the first to try to raise awareness about the glutamate, uh, monosodium glutamate and its association with how it's impacting the brain. And what we've seen is that MSG in our food supply has only increased when it started to be put into our food, fortified in our food after World War I. Our soldiers came home, the US soldiers came home, said our food tastes like garbage compared to the Japanese. What are they doing to their food that makes their food taste better? They were adding MSG to it, and so voila, we started having a lot more MSG being produced, and since then, it's only increased. Now this represents 1% of the total amount of MSG in our food supply because it's all in various different sources. It's not coming from MSG, and let me explain. The standard American diet, when I sit there and calculate you know, the SAD diet, how much MSG is the average person consuming? We consume about 15 grams per day, and it's not from foods that have a label containing MSG. It's from hydrolyzed proteins like you saw in the demonstration with gluten and casein, that when you start to chemically degrade these proteins, it starts to free glutamate. So they're putting in proteins as the starting material. We don't know, that's not on the label what processes, chemical processes, physical processes are going on in our food supply. And what's at the end food product is not required to be labeled as to what is the composition or the intactness of that protein. In fact, MSG used to be produced from gluten. They used to take gluten protein and hydrolyze it through chemical processes to make MSG. It's the same thing that's still going on today. They just are using gluten as the starting product and not informing you that there's an acid hydrolysis process in part of the chemical manufacturing, and we've got glutamate at the other end. But they found much cheaper ways, and now we're using fermentation of corn to produce MSG. So it's a fermentation process. So when I started to do my work in thinking about how I would do this experiment with removing free glutamate from the diet enriched in fortified sources, I realized it's no longer about science, it's about detective work. When you start to look at the various ingredients that contain free glutamate, you see a lot of the hydrolyzed proteins, hydrolyzed soy proteins, extracts, and it wasn't just MSG that we're looking for. There's over 50 different ways that you can label free glutamate or have free glutamate in these ingredients. There's a more comprehensive list on the website. I couldn't fit them all. <laughs> but texturized proteins, whey proteins, enriched things, maltodextrin, um, natural flavors. Anybody ever think about what the heck that is? Natural. It, yeah. So, and if you call these companies and say, you know, look, you know, your product looks really clean. I see four ingredients but it's got natural flavors in there. Can you describe where you're, you're getting, oh, we source the best. I'm like, what, what is the natural flavors? Not a single chemical or food manufacturer has been able to actually articulate in any sort of transparent way what the heck the natural flavors is, is in their food. It can be up to 80,000 different chemicals in natural flavors. There's 4,000 patents on putting free glutamate in the natural flavor ingredient label. Over 95% of our foods contain some sort of ingredient that contains MSG. And why do they do that? Why are food manufacturers doing this? It's a direct link to our neurological system and makes us think that food tastes good. It's the underlying mechanism of all addictions is the glutamate signaling pathway. 
And there's a massive obfuscation effort going on here that I like to kind of you know, make sure that people are aware of because it's like, well, why haven't I heard of this? Don't worry, you're not alone. Shortly after only published in 1969, the International Glutamate Technical Committee was formed. Why would you need an International Technical Glutamate Committee? Or Glutamate Technical Committee. There's over 50 different subsidiaries under that international committee. And it's protecting the interests of keeping glutamate in the food supply and not transparent. There's over 50 publications per year that are funded by the glutamate industry. It just swamps out anything like a scientist like Olney who's trying to raise awareness of the issue of glutamate in the food supply. And so I often am, you know, pointed to this particular um, publication by Giha et al. And it looks so impressive, you know, MIT, and I think there was uh, Harvard Medical School, where it's a multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multi-challenge evaluation reporting that there's no effects of MSG. Again, it's funded by the glutamate industry. And if you look at what the placebo is, the placebo itself contained free glutamate, and they never verified that the placebo didn't contain free glutamate. So you're essentially comparing oh, there was no reaction compared to placebo. Yeah, I believe that. And then, you know, I'm not the first one to all, you know, also try to raise awareness of this. Adrienne Samuels wrote a book. It wasn't Alzheimer's, it was MSG. And she discloses the story of how her husband was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. But as soon as they changed and got the MSG out of his diet, he was able to reverse his diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And she tried to go the political route, tried to get the FDA to do better labeling of foods. And I decided, with unblind my mind, to take a different approach with raising awareness through grassroots efforts and kind of empowering people to make the choice by being aware. Now, I love to bring in the whole microbiome component. I'm only going to do a few slides on this. But there is a glutamate component with the microbiome. The microbiome, or the microflora, represent 99% of our genetic composition. Like, think of that. So for every one human gene, there's 9 or 10 microflora or microbe genes. So they outnumber our human genes. And if we don't take into account their genetics and the metabolic makeup of these microbes, we're kind of missing a huge portion of our genetic composition. So microbial metabolism we're seeing all over the literature now definitely influences human health. And as these microbes go through the GI tract, they too produce chemicals. Protein fermentation is another way that glutamate is produced by these microbes. So protein fermentation is just another way of saying it's the microbes consuming or utilizing protein as a nutrient source, and what they're doing as a metabolic byproduct is producing glutamate. They also produce you know, many other chemicals such as phenols, ammonia, amines, and keto acids, which are very toxic to our system. So the colonic microbiota has considered proteolytic power, meaning it has lots of enzymes that can break apart these you know, proteins, and it can start to also you know, cause us to absorb the uh, glutamate from all of these byproducts. Glutamate is actually produced as part of their survival mechanism, and there's many, many different examples of how various different microbes will use glutamate as part of their survival. The one I like to mention the most is the, the Borrelia bacteria associated with Lyme. Uses glutamate because it can't synthesize it itself, but it uses glutamate and actually goes to places where glutamate is the highest concentration in our own, our host because it needs it as an osmoprotectant. It becomes more virulent, meaning more pathogenic, if it is protected in the right osmolality and it uses glutamate to do that. It also helps with stress conditions and so forth. But what you get, oops, what you get is a lot of microbes that are actually thriving on us producing more and more glutamate. And we do that the more inflamed we are, which is how it triggers into the inflammatory pathway. 
So I had a lot of evidence to suggest that glutamate being removed would help my child. I had the hardest time convincing my husband because he would look at the pantry and think of these comfort foods as, oh gosh, she's gonna take that away. <laughs> and so I begged him, I said, give me five weeks. Give me five weeks to transform her diet, see if I can remove enrich and fortified foods, and if we don't see any changes, okay, we'll find another ABA therapist, we'll start going to more neurologists and start going on a different path. And so here was the effect after that five weeks. She became extremely social. I have to wash my hair. Her language oh, yeah. improved incredibly. She started having all sorts of expressions of happiness and joy. He's giving me a flower. And I say, thank you. He says, you're welcome. And she was able to express her feelings and be able to, you know, absolutely convey emotions and, you know, be part of the world. Um, I, too, went on this approach with my daughter because I was like, okay, I'm not going to have her eating different foods. And at, the re at this point, I couldn't get the rest of the teenagers to participate in this, this experiment. I had 40 years of pollen allergies that disappeared. I had no idea what brain fog was until I got rid of it. I had these baseline headaches that I defined as normal that just disappeared. And it's like I felt like I was living the same life, but now looking through rose-colored glasses. And it's really hard to describe unless you go through that transformation. But it was like, OK, this was absolutely affecting my mood. My husband, who is now very sold on this, I used to be able to tell when he cheated. <laughs> and I have a chapter in my book, How Do I Know When My Husband Cheats? <laughs> he, you could just see the depression and anxiety on his face as soon as he ate something that you could tell just didn't agree with him. I'm like, and I would see this look on his face and be like, what'd you eat? <laughs> and so the, the fact, and he can't stand that I know how, what he eats, but the fact that I was able to actually see a physical change in his demeanor triggered him to be like, oh, well, you know, it probably is, you know, more obvious than I realize. And so it helps to motivate the whole family when you kind of point out those sort of things. So the whole approach is like redefining a new normal. And it wasn't just about her, but just like I just started to, you know, talk to families and friends. I started this nonprofit and just started to spread the word. And it is incredible about how many people, you know, will have a new change here. So Ms. Brooke lost her autism diagnosis. Um, she is now tested normal in the language area. I mean, she was in the fifth percentile when she was tested and actually qualified for special needs services. And she receives no learning accommodations at all at this point. Um, although I decided to pull her out of public schools because I didn't like public school. <laughs> And so when I started to take surveys about, okay, how can we improve this? How, what, what do we need to do to help people transform it, you know, and redefine their, you know, their diet? Um, mostly people report improved GI function. With the um, children on the spectrum, you know, I see great improvement with language. I also work with the chronic fatigue population quite a bit, and so there's a lot more improved cognitive function and energy. There's improved outlook, as I just described. You know, um, anxiety and depression I didn't even put on here, but those were other you know, symptoms that were often improved. Improved sleep, decreased signs of inflammation. And so these were all c collected from people who had transformed their diet and reporting back what they felt. So this absolutely convinced me, <laughs> for sure, we are what we eat. But the question is, what are we eating? And so I defined the program as reduced excitatory inflammatory diet, and, and just coincidentally, it is my last name. So it just fit perfectly. But it is all about consuming high fiber, nutrient-rich vegetables in proportion, much larger proportions than pretty much any other food nutrient. And then you have healthy fats, whole proteins, and, you know, um, fiber or whole grains, fruit, and herbs, you know, and you can do herbs. Um, as, much, as much as your taste buds can take, and it adds a lot of variety to the diet. 
And this really helps with the whole gut-brain connection because what a lot of people don't think about is that the microbes are getting a lot of the food too and they're producing chemicals in response to that food and those chemicals can either work for us or against us or be somewhat neutral. And there's a lot of literature now on the gut-brain connection and that illnesses that are impacting the brain are often coming from the gut. And there's an entire web supported by fiber fermentation. And so it's not just like, oh, we're gonna pr produce the short chain fatty acids. There's actually layers of different microbial compositions that go through the different fermentation processes of you know, insoluble fibers and you know, nutrient rich fibers. So I was absolutely convinced that Hippocrates had it right, that let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So I'd like, I really blew through that. I'd like to encourage you all to really control your microbiome and empower yourself and that 99% that is controlling your genetics. And here is a picture of the family fairly recently. And I actually got the teenagers to be on the diet now, or the, the program. And so like, uh, Somebody else was mentioning, you know, the, the 501c3 does thrive on, you know, donations. Um, and in, with any donation, you can receive um, a pantry list that can help you get started with recipes. Uh, there is lots of support on a Facebook group that's actually run by parents who have gone through the transition to give you tips and how to restock your kitchen. <laughs> and thank you for your attention. So, check. Lots of time for questions. Okay, okay. let's start here. I was wondering if you uh, could talk a little bit about glutamate and the connection to insulin. Yes. Or insulin resistance. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of um, glutamate receptors on the beta islet cells in the pancreas. And those glutamate receptors are responsible for releasing insulin. And so the glutamate receptors are actually regulating quite a bit of the insulin release. And so that's, that's one way. And then we did see that these cyclic AMP and glutamate are also co-associated with triggering <coughs> insulin release from the cell that's not glutamate receptor regulated. So there's a glutamate receptor regulation and also um, associated with cyclic AMP. And then with type one diabetes, um, there is also an association with the glutamate decarboxylase enzyme that antibodies are first detected against that enzyme before a lot of the other antibodies with the beta islet um, pancreas cells. And so it's actually becoming like a pre diabetic marker is looking for that. And I believe it's because glutamate decarboxylase enzyme function is upregulated with all of this regulation of energy that goes on um, with glucose and glutamate, and that enzyme is upregulated and the antibodies are starting to attack that. What was the pre-diabetic marker? Glutamate decarboxylase enzyme. It's, it's abbreviated GAD65 is the specific molecular weight of that protein. So GAD65 antibodies, um, and it's actually being seen quite a bit in type 2 now also. So we're, we're videotaping this, so this mic is really important, so make sure I get you the mic before you ask questions. Thank you. I think you are next. Have you seen, is this on? Yep. Have you seen any patterns of this kind of inflammation following somebody who has experienced a severe eating disorder? Um, have I seen the response of excessive glutamate signaling following eating disorders? Um, yes. And so, you know, particularly um, severe calorie restriction, however we want to call that eating disorder, um, you know, the triggering of anxiety and start this association with that, it, it is upregulating glutamate signaling pathways, um, you know, that, that can be reversed, but that is something that's going on during that 
starvation stress response of severe calorie restriction. So you think that could uh, keep on persevere afterwards? You know, and that's a very good question is, um, it's an inflammatory immune response and those immune cells really hold on to a memory and it really depends, you almost have to retrain your system. It can be done, but it does take a retraining and how you retrain each individual is, is a very individualized approach. But yes, I do think it does continue on and you can reverse it, um, but it does take retraining that, that immune memory cells to stop holding on to that stress. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is revelatory. <laughs> Thank um, you. What role does meat on, and healthy fats play in a high fiber, nutrient rich vegetable diet? And um, besides cutting out all the junk food and processed food, packaged food, did you have to eliminate other foods that seem healthy? but maybe high in glutamates? Um, that's a good question. So um, the only natural food, whole food, that we eliminated that is naturally high in, in free glutamate is um, seaweed. And it's hard, and unless you're going into the ocean and harvesting your own seaweed, I don't even trust what they're doing with the seaweed, you know, snacks and dry, you know, seaweed. But that is naturally high in free glutamate that we stayed away from. Um, meats, you know, have a lot of glutamate in their protein structure. And so, again, by keeping the proportion of meat consumption lower than your fiber content, so you're always giving those microbes the fiber source to ferment, not the protein source, because they prefer the fiber, then you can eat meat. It's just that you're not eating meat higher in proportion to your fiber. And that's a big part of the REED program, is, is making sure you're consuming more fiber than meat protein. And the vegetables need to be raw? Or cook? Not necessarily. So I like to get about 50% of the vegetable intake raw because you do preserve a lot more of the nutrients and that does preserve a lot of the fiber. But I, I do advocate cooked and I do think that works well in winter months too with people's bodies. Um, but I do like a lot of raw also. <laughs> more questions? Thank you very much, very insightful. Um, can, you, can you share maybe like the, I don't know, 20, 80 kind of thing, like uh, what to do, like 20% of things we can do to kind of get uh, some, to see some, some effects like today, this week, this month? Gotcha, uh, steps? Yeah. Yes, okay. And it's interesting, because I'm like, you know, I'm at that section of the book where I'm trying to write like, okay, how would I walk people through this in writing in a stepwise fashion? Um, so, you know, ideally, you know, getting a smoothie that has a bunch of nutrients and fiber in, especially with kids. So their kids are, you know, might be kind of doing their daily routine and eating, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if you can kind of get them to at least start consuming more nutrients, and I like to think of the, um, the smoothies chock full of lots of, you know, raw vegetables of various sorts and herbs and nuts and seeds and um, a little bit of fruit, you know, for palatability. Um, that, that's almost like a multivitamin, you know, it's like it's a great way to get some nutrients in there and lots and lots of fiber. Um, and then refined sugar, getting, removing that, and then, you know, really kind of thinking about every single packaged ingredient that you're reading is like, okay, you know what, I can replace this and with what whole food would you start replacing that with? Um, and so, you know, ideally we're working towards 60 to 70 percent vegetable consumption. Um, and that's not something that people just walk out of the gate and say, okay, I'm going to do it tomorrow. Um, and so it is, it's a journey, and I like to walk people through that journey. But it, it is like any meal, I say to people, see if you can throw three more vegetables on there. See if you can, you know, challenge yourself to have three to five vegetables in every dinner. Um, and start to kind of think about all of the variety that's afforded to us through mm -hmm. vegetables. Um, my quinoa salad I call the kitchen sink salad where I like to put at least 20 different vegetables in the salad. So it's just challenging yourself constantly think, oh, okay, I've got this, okay, I've got this. Oh, I didn't even know you could eat turnip greens. Let's throw that in the smoothie and, you know, really kind of expanding the horizons there. But getting rid of dairy is, was my, my big thing. I didn't realize how inflamed I became with 
the cheese and dairy that was in my diet. So that was a big one for a lot of people. It's, it's a very common constipator. It's, it's a, a, a inflammatory for many people. So getting rid of dairy, if you feel like you have a health issue, is a, is a good place to start. Gluten is another good one to get rid of. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so vegetables, add them in there, get rid of refined sugar, get rid of gluten and casein, and you know, add more vegetables to your repertoire would be kind of like the steps. Oh, he's got one more. Hold on, hold on too. Also, I'm not sure, but you know, I know there was one slide that you had back there, so that was like the pyramid thing. Maybe yes. the, if we pull that one back up, it might be helpful. Th this is as a side issue. Um, uh, I've seen, a, I've seen a, some studies done by some Norway, Norwegian scientists which study specifically the effect of, uh, of uh, milk and, uh, and glut, glut, glutamate on, on kids. And it was kind of on the same line. I, I, I don't remember right now at the top of my head, but probably if you Google, you can find, like, they, they had some really good results, so probably that's why other people are trying to do something similar. Yeah, I'll have to look that one up. Hi. Um, how about high fat diet? I saw a film maybe 10, 15 years ago about this man had um, epilepsy. Yeah, for ketosis. Or, and yeah. they had a uh, long time ago, they had the, they had the uh, article about the half, high fat diet. Right. But it's in a library of a Congress. Yeah, so the ketogenic diet, um, I, I do think that's more fat than is really helping with the microbial part of the equation. And so when I do work with you know people that do have epilepsy and they're trying to manage that, I am trying to reduce the fat relative to the, the fibers um, because there is a lot of microbes that love that fat and that is producing a lot of toxins. Thank you. And one more question. How about the mercury? Um, the yeah, mercury and any heavy metals in the brain. I mean, I, I like to try food approaches in all food first. See what the body's capable of doing, of spitting out these heavy metals from the cell and really get the cell healthy, get the cell spitting out whatever, virus, bacterial pathogens, you know, heavy metals, um, and, and see what the body's capable of doing first with eliminating that. But it takes kind of restoring and recovering that cellular metabolism to get to find out what the body's capable of. There are people who are not releasing these toxins and then you kind of need, you know, more help. How do you get rid of the heavy metal? Right. So um, I mean there so all heavy metals are not equal. So like, like you know, aluminum, for example, you know, Chris actually actually has a great YouTube talk and has done a lot of research with how to get aluminum out of the cell. But again, if by increasing cellular metabolism and increasing cellular health is is the read approach. And a lot of these heavy metals will then be eliminated, but it's in the blood, so you do want, you know, functioning you know, hepatic system and liver and, and kidney so that you're then sec secreting it out, making sure you're sweating so that you have very efficient ways of getting it out of your body once it's being dumped out of the cell. So like a, taking a sauna would help? Yes, it's a, you know, especially they've shown with aluminum that it's a very good, efficient way of eliminating um, heavy metals. Thank and you. toxins in general. <coughs> Hold got, on, got three, three people lined up here. Thank you. So I want to know what you snack on for like crunch instead of like, no, I'm not talking about a vegetable. Okay. It's just sometimes you just got to have something else. So besides nuts, like what would be like a crunch? Do you do some oh. sort of chip or some sort of, I mean, is there... Um, so vegetable chips, actually, you know, so I mean, so you can do potato chips, but like beet chips, kale chips, you know, those, those are all those, fine. Those are, you know, good, you know, even carrot chips. Um, I do like making my own like granola, you know, so, you know, that kind of has that crunch, you know, satisfying and it, it does provide a lot of satiety. Um, and so I will, you know, make potato chips and things like that too for that crunch. Um, and those are kind of my, my crunchy snacks. And do you drink anything then besides you just have smoothies and water and tea, basically? Smoothies, water, and tea, Pretty and much occasional okay. wine. Okay. <laughs> and then how, how long did it take you to notice changes? Did you start with a decent diet when you did your five weeks with your daughter? Like, and you said you changed. 
so did you start where you were in a decent diet, and then how long did it take you before you saw some of the changes you talked about? Yeah, for so um, we started removing with gluten and casein because I didn't know I didn't know about the glutamate connection at that point. So we removed gluten and casein, but you know there can be a lot of unhealthy diets with people who are still gluten and casein free, and we were kind of in that category. We were the ones that were kind of looking for what the replace the processed food replacement initially, right? Oh, it's gluten-free, we can put this in. Yeah. And we were adding a lot of vegetables at that time, but we still had a lot of packaged goods in there. And then we started the glutamate approach. And like I said, my daughter was still on the special needs. She was still having the yes-no loops. The week that we started the diet, I never once again saw that yes-no loop. It like vanished from her being. I mean, never again. The first week. And immediately we started to notice that it was like she was there. It was like she was now interested in looking at us and what we were saying. Her language needed some time to catch up, but we noticed immediately she was more interested in engaging with us. And that and, was the first week. What about week. you? Me? Yeah. My headaches actually went away that first week also. I mean, like I noticed like, you know, okay, I don't have that high pressure sensation in my sinuses that you know I had. Um, the brain fog, it took me a little bit more lo you know, longer to recognize that, but I was like, oh wow, you know, I'm not getting what I, I used to call food comas. I literally would just feel like, okay, I just wanna sleep, I'm not really kind of you know, on my game here because I just ate a burrito. Um, I would call those food comas. Didn't have that ever again. And last question: Have you seen this with any kids that are like? I have a friend whose um, child is in the. He's in a. Um, uh, he lives in a. He lives at a at a center, you know, because he's in a constant, you know, so a very extreme case. Have you seen any cases of really, you know, extreme case where there's a, even more so where there. Yeah, yeah, so I'm not um, this well, but. <laughs> if kids have some sort of language, meaning that they're not necessarily communicating, but they're able to make a sound, I've seen transformation with them in, in them being able to do language. The, the kids who have absolutely no sounds coming out of their mouth, it, it's not making a movement. There's something else going on that's not glutamate related. Um, and so, but they're not making any sounds whatsoever. But the, the whole auditory processing and the whole frontal cortex is so you know, extremely dependent on this glutamate signaling um, that if they have so, the capability of making sounds, that they are able to improve their language. Now, it's not all like my daughter, but there are some. And so when I took the survey, I'm like, how many people feel like this read lifestyle would be worth it, right? Because you're, you're definitely making more foods. You're not you know, relying on all these conveniences. You know, how many people really feel like it's worth it because they saw a significant change in their health? And 85% said, you know, hands down, we will never go back to eating the way we were um, because there was enough improvement in health that they were motivated to keep on it. You know, even if it's sleeping better and the parents sleep better now as a result, that was enough for them to be like, it's yeah. worth it. So you think it just, if, so my friend's child who, uh, his late teens and maybe knows 50 words, something like that. Uh -huh. um, so as long as there's some words, you've seen? I've seen improvement, cases. yes. And the severe is definitely the, the harder cases to move, uh, yeah. you know, especially if there's a genetic com component, you know, and that there is a certain part of the population has a genetic component. Um, it's really how it's manifesting itself metabolically and, and what can we do to kind of change the, the outcome of those genetic um, single nucleotide polymorphisms. But uh, um, the, the, the severe are definitely harder. But the, you know, it's, it's like parents are like, you know what, I'll take a 50% improvement. You know, it's like you know, they're not maybe getting them completely independent, but they're taking whatever improvement they can get through eating. And a lot of the severe have very, very limited diets, self-limited diets. And it's usually white processed foods that they're very addicted to. Right, thank you. My next, okay. So I have a couple questions, but not that many. <laughs> um, so I was just thinking that perhaps that umami taste is actually very glutamate um, involved. Yes. 
And, just, and there's an evolutionary reason why we've got the glutamate receptors on our tongue. I mean, you know, when we were foraging, you know, it allowed us to find, you know, where energy foods were, um, you know, ripe fruits, you know, would have more glutamate like the tomato. And, and it serves an evolutionary, you know, purpose. It's when we're abusing it and we're overexciting it to the detriment of the sour and the bitters that are in our vegetable receptors, you know, we're not getting the same stimulation with whole foods when you're enriching just the glutamate and you're getting that glutamate receptor signaling and then it causes this addiction. Oh, yeah, interesting. No, there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole evolutionary yeah. <laughs> component there. Yeah, and then, I mean, it seems to me that it's even more important to get organic things when all this is concerned, but how, I mean, if you had a choice of getting a better product that had less glutamate and an organic product, well, I guess most of them wouldn't, but you'd go with the the lack of glutamate before the organic even? Does that make sense? Um, you know, I, I don't eat non-organic because the glyphosate is also, you know, known to stimulate yeah. glutamate receptors. And so, you know, it, it's going to be part of the issue. Um, so, yeah, I, I'd rather actually go a little hungry. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I would too. I'm just wondering where the, you know, if you have to. And then the other one is um, that I understand that other grains have gluten besides rice and barley. Correct. The, the wheat gluten is, is I mean, very much, you know, has the 25% of its amino acid structure containing glutamate. So it's very, very rich. But like, you know, rice gluten has about 15%. So the more you process these grains, absolutely, you're going to free up glutamate the very same way that you do with the wheat gluten. So, you know, no rice pastas or anything like that. It's all whole grains, not adultered you know, by some sort of, you know, chemical process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so so uh, I'm curious, like, what, what would you say would be some of the best papers to refer to for, like, convincing maybe sort of skeptic people about uh, MSG? I've seen even, like, some popular kind of nutritionists that are normally good. Uh, saying that there's, there's no, no, no issue. problem I, with it yeah. or whatever. So. I saw it in the New York Times, too, and I just wanted to scream. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, I mean, because there, there really is just a huge amount of information just, you know, squashing or suppressing this story versus, okay, we've got glutamate that's doing wonderful things, and the glutamate signaling is great. Look at this. And the glutamate industry is actually, you know, very much funding that. Um, I do, I mean, I did put a lot of references in this one with, you know, particular, you know, disorders or ailments though, you know, so kind of thinking about that. Um, and I do have about a thousand references in my book, you know, because I, I'm thinking, okay, where's the naysayer going to come in and, you know, poke holes in this approach? Um, so I kind of try to approach it on, you know, a particular ailment, um, but then looking at, you know, what studies have been done to show that and, and I think that the Chinese, you know, population study was, you know, 10,000 people that correlated obesity with consumption of MSG. Of course, the glutamate industry came right behind it and said, nope, that's not true. Um, you know, and so every single publication that comes out saying there's glutamate issue, we've got 50 publications by the glutamate industry that suppresses that. Um, so, but they are out there. It's just... Uh, they're behind paywalls where the glutamate industry funded stuff doesn't have a paywall, so it's much more readily available to the public to you know, get the, the industry funded. Um, and if you want to look at some of the you know, references that I have in here with the underlying mechanisms of addiction, cocaine addiction, they even see you know, how it's regulating the glutamate you know, cycle and stuff, and so um, there's a lot on the addiction component. Does that answer your question? Not really. You want you want a one. Are the slides available somewhere? Um, well, they're recording. Yeah. It. In fact, that was the exact thing I was going to tell you. We're videotaping this. It takes us about three to four weeks, but it goes on our website, svhi.com. So share that video, and you can obviously stop the video at a certain slide because we're recording the slides. You can do that. Get a little more detail there, and yeah. So I just had a quick question about glutamine or glutamate supplements that are out in the world. Like, why would one take those? Because I know someone who takes it. I'm not sure why they do. But I was almost thinking that this talk was going to be about how we need to get more in our system. Right? Oh, so interesting. How, how wrong could I be? So why would one take a supplement? Yeah, so glutamine 
glutamine is a very common supplement that is being recommended by the medical industry quite a bit for um, leaky gut, right? So they're trying to heal the gut through glutamine. And I have seen so many people react adversely to that and they're not pinpointing that it's the glutamate um, or the glutamine. So glutamine gets converted to glutamate, particularly by microbes. So if you're feeding these microbes a ton of glutamine, they have all the enzymes necessary to convert glutamine to glutamate. And so absolutely, I say don't supplement. So when I see people, yeah, it's, it's not good at all. It is absolutely upregulating that whole glutamatergic system. Uh, I will be talking to my friend. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to know if you consider winter vegetables like butternut squash and acorn squash, are those, do you consider those vegetables? as far as you know as part of your diet and also are beans on or off your diet and if they're off why okay um so yeah i do I, you know the winter vegetables i do think that you know that plays into the natural variety that seasons afford us and so getting some of the you know the root vegetables um in is is great i still always do raw though and some people like the ayurvedic you know would not advocate doing raw at all in the winter I find that I do, you know, great with just keeping some raw components in there throughout the year. But yeah, squashes and beets and things like that are definitely in the diet. Um, now beans, like green beans, yeah, have at it. But the legumes, you know, really depends. You know, there's there's definitely an epidemic of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which I actually like to call SIPO, small intestinal parasite <laughs> overgrowth, um, that the upper intestinal tract can't have all that microbial population there. And so if I'm working with people that, with that GI issue, I like to resolve that before putting legumes in because that will definitely exacerbate symptoms, cause more bloating and all sorts of those issues. Um, and, and then beans can come in once that's resolved. So the main symptom of SIBO is bloating? Um, bloating, poor absorption of nutrients because the microbes are getting it first, um, lots of inflammation, um, and it, it really is an epidemic because we have far too little fiber in our diet and antibiotic use really just creates the perfect storm for upper intestinal growth. Thank you. Yeah. I the sequence of <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you ever figured out the etiology or what, if there was anything that created your daughter's situation, like vaccine or Yeah, you like know, that. and it, it is fascinating. You know, she was vaccinated at hours of birth. So I didn't even really know my child before the first vaccination hit. So I, I can't really answer that. But when I do go back and look at videos, it looked like she had eye contact and, you know, was developing, or, you know, at 11 months. And at 12 months, there, there was definitely loss of eye contact and just a developmental regression. Um, that is the time, you know, that a lot of foods come into the diet of a youngster. Um, it is the time of the MMR vaccine. I didn't notice any, you know, weird symptom following any vaccination. Um, and then also I was on antibiotics at six months pregnancy. I do think she was born with a distorted microbiome and was potentially vulnerable to that. And there's a lot of studies that show women who were pregnant and had antibiotics, you know, have more chances of a child with um, inflammatory issues. Yeah, that probably had a lot to do with it. Yeah. Did you see any relation with leaky gut with her as well? She were you had, working on that? She had the SIBO. I mean, I, I didn't mm -hmm. realize the bloating was that at that time, and I mm -hmm. then came to know what the term was. But she did. She had the very mm -hmm. bloated. She was constipated. She definitely had mm -hmm. the, uh, the symptoms of the GI issues. One side. <laughs> Keeping you uh, on your toes. <laughs> uh, speaking of glutamine, um, there's I have seen glucosamine and like chondroitin as a glucose. very popular supplement. What do you think of those? Yeah, glucosamine chondroitin. You know, it's interesting. After my car accident in my 30s, I remember you know trying to take that to help with my you know cartilage and, and ligaments and. Um, you know, I don't, I don't really do supplements at all now. I, I really try to do through food. And now there's certain instances like, pyro, you know, the cryptopyral issues where, you know, you're going to be deficient in B6 and zinc. And so there's certain circumstances, but, you know, for sure, 
that would warrant supplementation. But not knowing any of those metabolic disorders, I like to see where the body can, what, what it's capable of doing with healing itself through foods. Okay, one, one more quick one. Um, seeing the blender and all the vegetables and talking about smoothies, uh, how much do you think that uh, blending food like that up kind of actually destroys the fiber? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, my, my smoothies are pretty pulpy. I, <laughs> Um, I did a smoothie study at a medical center that I, I work with um, where I subjected some victims to um, doing four days of smoothie. And the doctor said, okay, you've got four days and we're going to do a microbiome test after each you know, day of the smoothie. So before day one, day two, day three, day four. And I'm like, oh man, I have four days to move the microbiome here with a smoothie. I made that thing so fiber rich. But it was so funny that people were like, okay, I'm gonna drink this, and then you know, they would immediately have a bowel movement. I mean, so it's moving. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about it but from everybody's feedback that it helps move the GI tract. So the fiber's getting in there and moving the system. <laughs> so um, I know that you like to do the smoothies, but what about juicing? Yeah, you know, and juicing does have the nutrients, but because it lacks the fiber, and I really am trying to promote fiber fermentation with this program, I don't like that because it has a lot of sugar, right? So it's got a lot of sugar that oftentimes is, you know, contributing to this upper intestinal tract growth. Um, but it does have a lot of nutrients. It just doesn't have that fiber that I'm, I'm seeking also in the diet. So the assumption in the statement is that the juicing would be a lot of fruit. Like I do heavy vegetable juicing, and I also do a lot of vegetables. Is there any issue with doing juicing as part of my regime? Um, in addition to a smoothie would be awesome, right? Okay. You know, so, but it is, it's kind of giving you a, a sugar, you know, um, even if it's vegetables, it's gonna have a lot of, you know, once you minus the fiber, it's still okay. gonna have quite a bit of sugar. Got it. Um, and so without that fiber, you can promote potentially, you know, bacteria fermentation of okay. sugar. And then the second question is, if you, um, talking about people who have taken antibiotics or have a, um, uh, difficulty with um, their microbiome. Do you have like a jump start? Like I know you don't like supplements, but like a lot of people propose taking probiotics and things like that. And usually some people, it would help to get an accelerated system if they have something specific they could take. Yeah, um, so you know, if, you know, so raw foods will have its own natural probiotics as well as like, you know, sauerkrauts, you know, kimchi without the added sugar. <laughs> Um, or beet kvass, you know, you know, as long as these things aren't adding sugar. Like I don't like kombucha because it's adding sugar. Um, and then if, if that's really not moving it, I do have, a, a, you know, some supplement, you know, probiotics. It depends, again, if I'm dealing with somebody whose gut was destroyed by antibiotics young in life and they destroyed the bifida, like, you know, so gut pro I kind of like for the younger. Um, the older, I kind of like the soil-based bacteria, you know, the the prescript assist, um, you know, as I've gotten a lot of good feedback on that one. Um, but ideally, we're just kind of trying to do that through foods as much as possible. But there are certain circumstances where people are like, okay, I just had antibiotics. And so in those cases, I'm like, yeah, let's, let's make sure we don't have opportunity for overgrowth of something we don't want. And are those recommendations on your website or in the book? I don't. Uh, it, is in the, it is in the, actually, I don't have it in the book. I usually do that through individual consults. So that's another thing that Unblind My Mind does is works with individuals or groups of people and helps them transform. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Maybe a more general question. Um, I go back years and my sister once said, I'm, I can't eat Chinese food uh, because of the MSG. To what extent are some people sensitive and some people not, or is this good for everybody? Yeah, as I find, it's, it's good for everybody to eat this way. It's just that some people, because of their, the canary in the coal mine sort of you know, being, re really need to. Um, otherwise, they really can't have a quality of life that they'd like. Um, but there are various reasons why somebody might be more sensitive to glutamate. Inflammation and immune dysregulation are probably the key ones. Like if somebody's more inflamed, their glutamatergic system is going to be upregulated. And that's how the nervous system and the immune system very much cross talk is through glutamate and glutamate signaling. Um, so the more inflamed somebody is, the more that they have allergies or, you know, or they've just recently came off of surgery or whatever surgery, you know, an injury. Um, they're going to be more vulnerable or susceptible to the, the glutamate sensitivity because their system's upregulated. Next question. 
Um, for the raw vegetables part, um, f for instance, for about the broccoli or spinach, do you since you are going to use uh, much more quantity than you know most people do, do you blanch them first before you? put in smoothie or consume? Um, in the smoothie, I, I just put that in raw. Um, you know, broccoli, you know, I like like lightly steamed if I'm having it separate. You know, um, uh, you know, interestingly, broccoli has glutathione, and glutathione gets destroyed if it's cooked at all, you know, even blanching. So, um, you know, so in order to get some of that glutathione in, that's naturally, although we do, you know, synthesize it from two amino acids, too. Um, I, I do like, you know, just putting everything that's in the, Smoothie, raw, organic, unadulterated. <laughs> no protein powders. Did I mention that? So how about the uh, a different thing? It's uh, like soy sauce should go avoid or yeah, yeah. It's so okay soy to sauce use? is fermented right. soy. And back to the, uh, somebody's question about the grains. You know, when you ferment a grain because it does contain, you know, 15% glutamate in its protein structure, that's why soy sauce has MSG. Is it's the fermenting of the soy? Thank you. You uh, two things you mentioned um, really quick. Um, aluminum. Um, you said you mentioned a name or a protocol for aluminum. Yeah, so Chris Exley, E X L E Y, he's um, a. What is a, it? A, um, Chris Exley, E X L E Y, and he's a British scientist that has done a lot of research on aluminum, um, how aluminum is getting picked up by immune cells and being transported to the brain, and then he was looking at different. Uh, populations with the amount of aluminum in the brain compared to normal um, or healthy, and then has a protocol um, which is very easy. It's it's um, involves silica water, it has to be solubilized in water. The silica, like Fuji water, has 90 milligrams of silica. Um, so you want a mineral water with silica in there, and the silica, when it's solubilized in water, has an inorganic. You know, the structure actually chelates the aluminum out of the cells. It, what did you call that? The what? The something Silica? Water? No, the the water. Oh, Fiji. Oh, Fuji. Fiji. Fuji. 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 Fiji. Fuji. Fiji. Fiji. Is it F-I? Yeah. F-I. Fiji. Fiji. <laughs> okay, and then how did you come up with the CPO? Um, well, SIBO, a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, is something that's actually tested in a lot of, you know. Yeah, I know about SIBO, but oh, you said CPO. CPO. Because it also consists of the, the fungal kingdom, the viral, you know, kingdom, and it's not just bacteria. So the B in SIBO stands for bacteria, but it's not just bacteria. That's just what we've been able to sequence through a lot of the microbiomes and stuff, but there's a whole, you know, microbiome and virome that we have yet to really learn about that is also part of our ecosystem. Okay, got it. Thanks. And it's not, and it's not necessarily micro in nature. It could be macro too, right? We could be looking at larvae of worms that are, you know, a part of the ecosystem too that could be distorted in the balance. You know, I mean, we've got dogs and cats all over the place. It's probably good to think about those things. <laughs> So going back to the aluminum, um, for heavy metal testing, there's a whole variety of tests you can do, and a lot of them seem rather sketchy or ineffective. What would you recommend? That's a good question. I mean, when people give me the results, I review them, but it's not like I necessarily recommend go out and get those. Um, I, again, just try to deal with, okay, let's see how far your body is at, you know, removing whatever. Because it's like, you know, here's the things we know. Here, what about all these other things that we don't know, we don't know how to test for. So. You know, so I don't usually advocate, like, go get some heavy metal testing. Um, but those that are out there, um, you know, urine is, is probably a good one. I mean, although that doesn't necessarily tell us how much heavy metals is in your cells, right? So all of these tests just show you how much is being released out of your hair or urine, but doesn't necessarily say, okay, is that because I'm getting frequently exposed? Right. So unless you're doing, okay, here's, you know, periods of time, are my levels going up or down? Okay. so that you know what your exposure is relative to what you're um, excreting. So does your diet do a natural chelation of the metals? 
Yeah, so a lot of the fiber, you know, I love cilantro, which is great about helping with getting heavy metals out. Um, lots of herbs that kind of just help with, you know, getting things out of the mucosa layer. And, you know, um, so this does do a lot of that just naturally by helping with the cell metabolism. Okay, thanks. And regular saunas as well. It's yes, good yes. practice to do saunas. I, I love saunas. Once, two, three times a week even. Have a uh, you, you, you mentioned that this, this is good for everybody. Yeah, I agree. But uh, um, how, how would one know that uh, they really need to do this? Like uh, what would be some symptoms, for example, one, one person would know that, you know, this, this is important to do, right? Yeah, so, I mean, like, I felt like I wasn't on there for a health mission, but boy, you know, so if you're looking to lose weight, boy, that there's, I mean, I just dropped weight that I was not looking to do. Um, energy, better sleep, you know, those are kind of some of the things that we struggle with, you know, reduced anxiety, um, better mood, I think are some of really motivating factors that kind of help drive people to kind of continue on that um, motivation. There's lots of um, physical signs of inflammation that you know each individual person might have. So I love trying to get the whole family on it. They might come to me for a particular family member. I'm like, no, 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 the whole family is doing this. And then you know the father is like, oh my gosh, I had eczema, you know, for all these years, and the eczema cleared up. You know, so all sorts of different motivators for the individual, depending on what your you know, your squeaky wheel is. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's like, you know, sleep, depression, and anxiety are kind of big ones that typically people will see improvements in. Uh, the GI tract. Any more questions? Any recommendation on the oils or? Oils? Intake of the oils, which one is better? Or? Yeah, so for cooking, you mean? Or, or just like spooning and, and consuming? Uh, cooking. Cooking, yeah. You know, not deep frying, but just to add cooking, spices. Yeah. So. Um, you know, so as they mentioned with Weston Price, you know, the, the, the more easily you extract an oil from something, the less processing it has to go through. So, like, trying to extract an oil from a seed is a lot of processing, right? So, if you stay away from seed oils, you avoid some of the processing involved. So avocado oil is actually a good um, high smoking point oil, meaning it's not smoking at lower temperatures. I don't cook with olive oil. It's great for salad dressings and you know dips and, and that sort of thing because it is a low smoking point oil. Um, coconut oil is about a medium, you know, so that can smoke, you know, if you're making like um, a stir fry, you know, you wouldn't want to use coconut oil. Um, so those are, you know, some oils that you can kind of put throughout the diet depending on what your temperature is of your, your cooking. Um, nut oils are also good. It's just hard to find a nut oil that's in a glass container and not in a can, and I hate the cans. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, I actually would like you to go a little bit into some of the areas here, like high fiber vegetables. Soluble, insoluble, what, what kind of things, are there any vegetables that you don't lean towards too much or? Yeah, so the starchy vegetables would not be in that category. So, you know, you don't see like corn and peas and, and potatoes in, in that high, cat, high fiber vegetable category. And it's both insoluble and um, soluble. Um, inulin is the insoluble fiber as an example. Um, you know, onions and garlic and asparagus, um, fennel, you know, have great inulin sources. but there's lots of other, you know, great soluble fibers, you know, you know, in kale or chards and things like that. So I, it's both soluble and insoluble fiber, but not starchy vegetables. How about whole proteins? Whole proteins would be, you know, nuts and seeds, um, eggs, you know, grass-fed, wild-caught meats. Um, and there's actually proteins in vegetables. You know, broccoli's got, you know, a source of protein, asparagus, artichokes. You know, so when I'm dealing with people who can't really seem to consume proteins because of their sensitivities, I look for the protein-rich vegetables. How about whole grains? I mean, you know, where do you, where do you, you know, pull your grains from and, you know, what grains would you avoid? Um, 
so I pull my, I usually do the bulk of, you know, so I'm in hippie Santa Cruz, you know, so I, I love New Leaf, <laughs> if anybody knows New Leaf. Um, so the bulk section there, getting the whole, the whole grains, um, buckwheat, groats, you know, oat groats, um, uh, what other whole grains, whole grain rice, you know, not white rice because that's polished, you know, so whole grain rice, quinoa, um, teff. Um, you know, even though teff is a wheat, it's like, it's, you know, if you're, it's an ancient grain that my, we, our family doesn't seem to have sensitivities to. Um, and so that would be examples of the whole grains. Um, and then what do I avoid? You know, I do avoid the, the wheat, um, the barley, um, and any processing of those grains. So even rolled oats, I avoid. I do the oat groats. Okay, getting close to the last questions. Um, doesn't some quinoas have gluten in them? Um, as, as this person was saying, the, there's usually gluten in grains. You know, so the wheat gluten has a lot of glutamate um, in it, but like oats have gluten in them also. Um, but it's, you know, it's normally the, when we refer to gluten-free, we're referring to the, the class of proteins of gluten in wheat. Um, so quinoa is a grain. It still has a, a gluten component to it that has protein in it. But again, that's why we don't do the processing um, at all. And I did try an experiment with doing wheat berries and making my own flour. Um, and this was actually early on in our journey where my daughter was much more sensitive than she is now, and she had a terrible reaction. So I kept wheat berries out of the, the diet, but it's a, it would be a good experiment to do now because she seemed a lot less sensitive in Europe to little exposures of gluten. Um, didn't seem to affect her at all. Again, speaking to the processing that's going on in America. <laughs> all right, last question. Anybody? All right, let's thank uh, Catherine.